And today we're going to be doing wetland design tools with Justin McBride. He's going to go over some of the basics on doing some wetland design work and some of the AutoCAD features. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Justin. All right, thanks, Tim. Just double checking, can you hear me good? Yep. OK, I can only see my screen, the presentation, so if you get any uh, uh, raised hands or any questions in the chat box, just uh, stop me and I'll I'll address them as they come in. So or okay. we can take them at the end either way. So. OK, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Tim said, today's TDP webinar is on wetland design tools. I just want to make this uh, up front uh, pretty clear. Uh, what I intend to give you today is not an all encompassing TDP two or three day class where we sit down and we do design examples and we go through the entire dike standard, the wetland creation standards and all the other ones that are possibly associated with it. Uh, we just don't have time for that in uh, a setting like what we're doing here today. Uh, that's more for an in person in depth uh, instruction type class. But what I do hope to give you is a couple pieces of information first on basic uh, site criteria and then also go through a diked wetland design spreadsheet that I'll explain here in a second. And then uh, hopefully if we have time at the end also give some live demonstrations on uh, some methods for developing either a dike design in AutoCAD or uh, a grading method to create these shallow excavations, both of which are 3D processes where we will create 3D surfaces. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to do is I want to uh, remind everyone, uh, particularly what we're talking about here today, what we're dealing with mostly is wetlands that are going through the CREP program. Uh, most of them are part of the ODNR H2 Ohio uh, Water Quality Incentive Program. Um, and those programs have specific rules and the big one I want to point out is that any wetland that you put in through the program needs to have at least 51% of the pool area to have hydric soils. Now there's been some question back and forth the last couple of weeks about is it 51% of the pool area or 51% of the total buffer area plus pool area? No, it's 51% of the area where we have water. OK, and that makes sense because the hydric soils hold water. They have hydric features throughout the year. Uh, you don't want to put these things in non hydric soils and just say, well, we have hydric soils elsewhere in the program area, so we're going to be. No, that's just trying to fit it to the farmer's liking. We're not doing that. What makes sense is you, you have to have 51% of the pool area to be hydric. Uh, but that's not the only thing you have to check, OK? Yeah, you can find a site that's got meets that certain 51% criteria and then the other 49% maybe nine uh, non hydric soils. Um, but there's a couple more steps that you should do just to double check that what you want to do is going to work. And in particular, you want to check the areas that are not mapped as hydric, but will still be included in the pool or in the buffer area. There are sometimes some soils uh, that aren't necessarily a clay based soil. Uh, but are still mapped as hydric. They have a high permeability when drained, but in a natural setting they don't. And generally that's because they have some sort of underlying subsoil condition that's slow draining or some other scenarios going on to where that soil is mapped as hydric. Uh, in the specific example I, I gave you here, you can have a sandy soil that's mapped as a hydric um, and then it can be neighboring sandy soils that are not uh, mapped as hydric and that could be because there's no no clay bottom at the bottom uh, at the bottom of the sand. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to build a pool in those non hydric sandy soils to where you're not going to have any water pooling up because it's going to pull up in the hydric areas, but then drain out through the non hydric areas. So you got to double check all that stuff. And I do have a specific example I'll go through. Uh, I put in here maintain a minimum 25 foot uh, distance between those uh, typical scenario soils, but that 25 feet isn't a hard line number. It could be 50 feet, it could be 100 feet. It's whatever you're uh, really comfortable with and whatever the site uh, site limits are. OK, the big thing is here. Check with a soil scientist uh, just to make sure that you've got those hydric areas clearly mapped out and maybe point out some other issues that might might be going on with those soils. 
This was an example here in Henry County we had just this year. Uh, this specific soil type mapped as GO is a uh, Guilford. It is mapped as hydric and it is a sandy soil and it has no clay bottom. And it kind of threw us for a loop. Uh, why would a sandy soil with no uh, subsoil limitations be uh, mapped as hydric? Well, in this case, this soil is uh, mapped as hydric because it receives groundwater uh, flows from landscapes at a higher elevation. So basically you have some water at an outside elevation, a higher elevation pushing down through the soil and then coming up from the bottom to create a high water table in the sandy soil type. Pretty rare in Northwest Ohio, but it does happen. And so in these cases, it is bordered by other sandy soil types, but they are not mapped as hydric and they will not hold so, um, a pool water. So we just gotta be pretty careful in those areas to make sure that we stay within the hydric soils only. That's for pools and that can be applicable towards uh, shallow excavations, but also uh, in the pool areas created by a dike. Um, the one thing is when you build a dike, you also have to worry about the soils for the construction materials of the dike, the fill material, let's say. Uh, and there are ways for us to figure out whether the material that's on site is going to be useful for a dike or not useful. Uh, in general, we use the unified soil classification system, which if you've had the soil engineering TDP class, um, that is the way we go about figuring out what's going to work and what's what's not going to work. And those soil types that we shoot for mostly for a dike are usually going to be a lean clay to a fat clay. Uh, there are occasions, as you'll see here, to where we're limited on the amount of clay at the site to use for the dike. Uh, so sometimes we will, if we have enough of that, we will build the core, the center material of the dike, uh, uh, build that up with a good good uh, material and then sort of layer on the outside some of the bad bad material. And what that'll do is that'll prevent any uh, seepage through the dike, but it, it'll also protect it uh, uh, structurally. OK, so you just want to make sure if you're going to build any kind of dike, just make sure you get a soil scientist out there to find where the good material is or an engineer that uh, you can make sure that that is present on site. Uh, this was another site. Well, actually, this was the same site in Henry County just across the, the stream where we're going to build a dike marked here in purple or pink. Um, and then the blue area, of course, would be the pool behind the dike. Uh, this was one where the soil where most of the pool area is. If you can see my mouse here, most of that is mapped as hydric and that is a nice, nice clay soil. Good stuff to build a dike out of. But there is the surrounding soil here that is a, a, a sandy soil that is about three foot of sand overlaying good good yeah. clay material. So you just got to be careful and understand where these areas are on the field so that if you need more material than what you can get out of the good clay that you might have to come over here and you might have to remove three feet of sand and get down to the good clay. And you can see at the bottom here I've kind of put that in the um, uh, some of the notes for this site. So along with soils, the other thing you got to worry about is the uh, typical hydrology coming to the wetland. OK, uh, these um, descriptors here that I've put on this slide are mostly for um, good reduction of phosphorus scenarios. So um, in other words, if the goal of the wetland is to reduce phosphorus, these are the things you have to kind of fine tune and get pretty close to what I have listed here uh, so that above all else you can maximize the uh, peat buildup rate okay really uh, when it comes to phosphorus the only way that you can hold phosphorus in a wetland is you have to be building up the peat at the bottom and the way you do that is uh, by these factors here but the big one probably the, the one we look at the most is the watershed to pool uh, that says patio it's supposed to be ratio that's uh, that's a misspell four to one OK, that's that's a small watershed to pool ratio. Uh, most of the ones we do where it has any kind of uh, a watershed coming to it are usually bigger than that. Now, it's not to say if you have a 10 to 1 watershed to pool ratio that it's not going to do any good to phosphorus. It's just the bigger you go over 4 to 1, the less likely or uh, less efficient it will be for storing phosphorus. OK. Now, what does that mean? If you have a pool to watershed ratio, or I guess watershed to pool ratio 
of less than four to one, which is a typical scenario. Anytime we go out there and dig a hole in a flat uh, sort of landscape, it's usually not going to have a large watershed ratio. That's pretty common. Uh, that's not really an issue. It's not really a concern from an engineering uh, standpoint. Uh, it's pretty easy as long as you got the good soils, you can hold water, right? Um, and it's probably going to be good habitat for the native wildlife, and you're probably going to get some good uh, vegetation growing in it. And uh, what what watersheds that is coming to it, maybe be bringing some phosphorus, maybe bringing some nitrogen. It'll probably do a good job at reducing those those nutrients. But the question is, if that's your goal, uh, is it really efficient enough? Uh, is it uh, really worth the money, let's say, to reduce those nutrients when you have a uh, very small watershed to pool pool ratio. Which on the flip side, usually a dike scenario, we normally have a much bigger watershed coming compared to the pool we can build behind the dike. Okay, sometimes rarely we can get up to a 100 to 1 ratio. I try to avoid those sites because um, you can get into all kinds of issues that, that goes on. But the one thing that this presents for us is some some design uh, some design challenges with the spillway design. Uh, basically, the bigger the watershed it is, the bigger um, the uh, spillway size is going to have to be for the principal and for the emergency spillway. OK, so we just got to keep those things in mind. The third thing I wanted to mention here before I get into the design aspects of this is floodplains. A lot of these sites for the water quality incentive program we've been doing uh, have been inside floodplains. They're mapped as hydric soils, but they're they're inside the mapped 100 year floodplain. OK. Uh, the one thing we got to keep in mind is that streams move. Streams and rivers, they over time they move and they dump out uh, coarse grain sediment as they move. OK, so there, there's a good chance that anything that's mapped hydric uh, within a floodplain uh, has non hydric inclusions of significant size, which normally that's not a a big issue, but it depends what those are. Like I said when I was talking about the soils is that you want to have soils that will hold water because if they don't hold water. You don't have a pool there for any time of the year unless it floods. Uh, you're probably not going to have good wetland function. So uh, when you plan these sites and floodplains, just be aware of shallow excavations that you want to try to avoid any kind of rise in the elevation one to two feet, let's say. Uh, sort of like the, the small knobs in the floodplain. Uh, generally, that's where we expect to find those types of soils, but that's not saying that that's what's there, or that's not saying you can't have poor soils that are in the non rises uh, within the floodplain. But the key thing is always get a soil scientist out there, especially if you're in a floodplain, because those soils are so variable, you just don't know what you're going to get. Dikes, dikes and floodplain, as you can see here, Pretty much anyone that um, has worked with me knows that I'm almost always going to say no uh, to a dike in a floodplain. There's just so many unforeseen things that, that can go wrong, uh, not just with the design and what can happen later on, but maybe we're missing a permit that we need that we're not aware of, and then there, there's issues with that uh, for the landowner down the road. There's just so many unknowns what could happen. Okay, occasionally there is a chance, and I'll go through an example here where. Um, the best scenario would be to build a dike, OK? But that's very rare. The other thing is for both of these, for both the, the shallow excavation and for dikes, is any material that we dig in the floodplain, uh, whether it's for the shallow excavation or you're digging uh, for some other reason, that spoil material must go outside of the floodplain. Now, I'm not telling you that because that's a law or that's a rule. It, it, it has been a, a rule in, in the past. It may not be a rule now. I'm honestly not as familiar with the Army Corps and the FEMA rules as they exist today. Uh, but generally, whenever we plan something, we're always going to plan to put the spoil outside of the floodplain uh, for that same reason. We just don't want to cause any unknowns that occur down the road for the landowner. OK. Hey, Justin, before you jump on, we had a question in the chat. Is there a problem with building a wetland in a floodplain because you're going to alter the floodplain? You touched on that a little bit. So um, y yes and no. So on this slide here, you say I I put on here 98.7% no, but I put 100% uh, within the floodway, um, which is actually the next slide here. What I wanted to talk about is the floodway in general, and I say in general because this is going to 
change once you get to the eastern part of the state. In general, a floodway, if you think of the this kind of a cross section of what a floodplain is, you can see there it's kind of mapped out there for the 100 year storm. A floodway is anywhere within the channel that once it starts to flood is still flowing downstream. So if you can think of a a flood in your uh, I'm in your imagination of what a flood uh, sort of looks like. There's areas that aren't flowing that it's sort of standing water to the side and then once you go sort of closer to the stream there is that same flood water is moving downstream. OK, where that that flow occurs is typically mapped as a floodway. OK, so you have to be kind of aware of what goes on with with the stream morphology over time of where that uh, floodway can occur. Um, what you don't want to do is you definitely don't want to sort of dam up that area where the flow occurs because that's where you're going to have big issues down the road. Uh, so if you're asking me if the question is can we alter the floodplain? Um, generally we want to try to avoid it with any kind of dikes and or anything that would reduce the floodplain size. So in this case anything that would shrink the floodplain. We want to try to avoid that if we can, um, but that's not to say that we can't do that and in, in this upcoming example here, not this one, but the next one, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. This was an example this year in Putnam County. You can see the blue line to the north and to the south. That is the extent of the floodplain, the 100 year floodplain. OK, and if you think about the way the river kind of wraps around in a U, all right, when it floods, it's going to push from in this case it, it flows from the east east to the west so it's going to push from the east to the west across that area that I have marked out there that's a, a blue and the area that's marked in the existing CRP. That's when it floods that's which way the water's going to push through you're going to have moving water through this area. So even though in this specific case of that it actually was not mapped as a floodway, I would strongly resist any kind of spoil material or dike that would uh, impede that that flood that uh, those flood waters that would cross that area. OK, that's not to say that something you couldn't do up towards the blue line where maybe you don't have as much flood waters moving, uh, but in this case it's pretty clear that when this floods it's going to be moving right across that whole whole U shape. OK, so that that would be one where I would say don't put any spoil, don't put a dike, shallow excavation only. In this case, uh, same thing again, the blue line to the north and south are the uh, 100 year floodplain extents. Uh, this was in Putnam County uh, again, different site though. This is one where if you kind of take, if you can see my mouse here, if I can, here we go, pull it up. If you kind of take the sort of floodplain cross section of the, the blue line here to blue line there, that's kind of your floodplain width, your floodway width. If you can imagine in your mind the floodwaters, which way they would flow. OK, so in this case we're flowing east to west again. Uh, they would kind of flow this whole way through here like that. They wouldn't necessarily uh, flow up into this extension of the floodplain that happens to go into this field. So in this case, I may be a little more comfortable to build a dike in this case here where the pink area is and cut off the floodplain, but still allow the floodway to go through. OK, it's still it's still going at sort of its natural flood width uh, to move through here. All right. I'm not saying that this is allowed. We still got to check with the floodplain coordinators for this county, um, but this would be a scenario where because of the the slope of the ground, if we build that pink area into a dike, we can control a large amount of water and we can really try to maximize those phosphorus reduction standards that, that we um, that we showed earlier. OK, so those are kind of two two uh, uh, separate uh, scenarios where I would do a dike if if we can and then where I would not do a dike. OK. So before I jump into the dike design spreadsheet, uh, there is one section of the dike standard that I want to show to you. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because there are a lot of little uh, notes and bits here that you need to be aware of through the dike standard, but th this is the one where uh, the spreadsheet was really built to tell you what to do. OK. Uh, you can see here um, within the table that there are basically four scenarios for the for a uh, drainage area coming to a wetland. Um, in this case, uh, depending on which or uh, 
I'll say how big your watershed are, is depend uh, dictates the size of the principal spillway, the size of the auxiliary spillway, but also the elevation difference uh, between the two. OK, so you can see over here that's marked down here in the minimum stage between the principal and the auxiliary crests. It also tells you the the design storm we should be planning through the principal spillway or through the uh, through the auxiliary spillway. All right, so keep that in mind. This table is built into the spreadsheet and it should it should be accurately uh, reflected within the design. And then also on this, there are two notes. There's more than uh, uh, there's more than two notes in the standard for this table, but the two I wanted to show here is what explains what the effective height of an embankment is and what the total height of an embankment is. OK, Th those two. Um, features are listed here in the table. Um, I'm going to you can kind of read this right now or you can pause it if this has already been recorded, uh, but I will try to explain these a little bit more in, in some some uh, of the upcoming cross sections that I'm going to show. All right, let's get into the first tool that I'm going to show today, the wetland dike design spreadsheet. This may be, probably is, pretty new or pretty unfamiliar to a lot of you. Uh, this is something that we have used in area one specifically uh, for the last, let's say, 15, 20 years. Uh, I've updated it over the years. It should reflect the newest uh, standard that was out in 2019. Uh, but it's something that we use to get the elevation uh, for the dike, for the spillways and everything, uh, and get all that stuff sized properly. All right, that's really what it's for, is sizing the spillways properly. Okay. Let's go through this real quick, and then I'll pull up the actual spreadsheet, and I'll kind of show you what switching some of the, uh, the, some of the design information around does and what the spreadsheet will spit out at you. Uh, starting here at the uh, design information section, you can see those boxes are all red outlined. And what that means, you can read that at the top there, but what that means is those are design parameters that you can input to sort of uh, sort of tweak your uh, dike design towards your specific site. So you can see that ask things like the drainage area, you can figure that out uh, outside of this. Uh, You'll obviously need to do a survey of the site before you can in input the elevations, but basically that's where you would get those as you would do the survey and you would figure out whether you want the dike. You would input those elevations, choosing your uh, your dike slope um, and your, your permanent pool elevation, your emergency pool elevation, which I'll try to go through when we get into the AutoCAD uh, uh, section, how I start with those elevations when I do a dike design, okay? Uh, the next section is the principal spillway entry data. There's two two boxes here up top that are in blue, and those are again those are things you have to enter physically, uh, but those aren't things you can change based on your own desire. Uh, these are things that come from your EFH2 printout. So these are actually the watershed uh, statistic numbers. In this case, it's a two-year storm, so 26 CFS, and the amount of runoff. Uh, as far as uh, watershed inches is 1.12. OK, those come right off your EFH2 printout. At the bottom, you can see there's more red boxes. And again, these are things you'll change. Um, these are more input information you can use to size the principal spillway. Now, I'll talk about this when I actually get into the, the uh, spreadsheet, but in most cases, I'll say 95% of the cases you're using the spreadsheet, you're not going to be entering anything in for the water control structure or the principal spillway. Um, and I'll talk about why that is here in a second. Things to keep in mind, if you select the armored uh, for, for the emergency type, if I go back up here to the previous slide, that was right here in the red, there's a drop down and you can either pick uh, a vegetated or you can pick armored. If you pick armored, which again, I'll talk about why most of the times we are going to do that. Uh, this spreadsheet doesn't even bother to calculate the principal spillway size, and that's because within the standard we don't. Uh, we aren't required to OK, if we can size the the emergency spillway to handle the entire design storm, then we don't need to have a principal spillway that can carry a certain storm. OK, so that's why we normally don't uh, 
do anything with this section of the principal spillway. Um, but if you select the vegetated type, then you may have to change that a little bit. The way that this spreadsheet calculates your principal spillway size is it, it accounts for uh, uh, routing the storm. And what that means is that uh, you'll have a permanent pool at some elevation. The storm comes and then that pool elevation is going to fill up. It's going to increase in elevation. Um, and it's going to keep increasing in elevation until it gets to the emergency spillway. So it'll be discharging through the principal spillway until it gets to an elevation of the emergency spillway, and then you'll have some uh, some discharge through there. OK, but there is a time delay from the point when that storm first reaches the principal spillway till it fills up to the uh, to the emergency spillway. There is a time delay. And because of that, there is a method that allows us to reduce the size of the flow needed to pass through the principal spillway. And this is important because even though we're not doing this on the principal section, we will do this on the uh, the emergency spillway section. OK, so just like uh, before, there is these uh, these two blo uh, these two blue boxes that we get from the EFH2 printout. Um, the peak flow, which in this case is a 25 year storm and the, ro uh, the runoff volume, which is in watershed inches. OK, the spreadsheet uses those same methods for uh, for routing the storm as it did in the principle to figure out what kind of reduction from that 25 year storm is what we need to pass through the auxiliary spillway, which in this case you can see that I have up here the 25 year storm was 62 CFS. We have some storage of floodwaters, so we can reduce that uh, uh, just down to about 52 CFS. So we reduce it 10 CFS because of the site uh, site limitations. OK. Uh, all right. The last couple of sections are things that have more to do with the construction of the dike, but also uh, some information you'll need for the engineering plans. The first one, the, uh, are the anti seep collars. Um, if you're familiar with those, those are them rubber membranes you slip around the pipe that goes through the dike. Um, all this does is it, it uh, sort of calculates the size of the collars and also the number of collars you need. There are some equations sort of behind that, but just keep in mind that you want to pay attention to the collar size because most of these dikes that we do for these wetlands, especially up in northwest Ohio, they're pretty short dikes and I'm talking six foot or less. Uh, so if you have a collar size that's, you know, four foot, five foot or bigger, uh, there's potential where that top of the collar could stick through the top of the dike, which of course is not a good design. So just keep that in mind. You want to keep the collar size limited down to probably about three feet would be the best if you can. Uh, but then there's also a point where uh, the number of collars becomes way too many collars to put on a pipe. So just sort of keep that in mind. And then the last section, that's all your information that you'll need for the uh, for the engineering plans. You can see you've got the permanent pool elevations, emergency spillway elevation, uh, top of the bank and everything like that that you'll need to put on the profile of the dike. There is three example cross sections in the spreadsheet on different tabs. Um, this one, the first one here that I'm showing the water control structure is by far the most common. Uh, probably 95% of the dikes we're building out there are going to have a water control structure. Um, even though we we aren't necessarily sizing the principal spillway, it is acting like a principal spillway in the fact that we're using it to control the permanent pool elevation of of the wetland. OK. This is where I'd like to kind of explain the difference between the effective height of the dike and also the, the total height of the dike. The spreadsheet as it calculates it um, according to the standard, the effective height of the dike is basically the elevation of the emergency spillway. So this this sort of a sort of dark black black line going through right here. That elevation minus the elevation of the center of the dike where the natural ground level is. So in this case it's probably where the flow line of the pipe is in this uh, a specific uh, specific example. But 
that's what the effective height is. The difference between this elevation and that elevation of the existing ground, center of the dike. OK. The total height of the dike is the top of the settled dike elevation, which um, in this previous slide you can see we have that elevation here, uh, minus the elevation of the existing ground of the back slope of the toe of the dike at the lowest elevation. So that's a lot of stuff to kind of say, but basically it's uh, the lowest elevation of the down uh, side slope of the dike. OK. And as long as this this elevation up here at the top of the dike minus the bottom at the toe, if that's below six feet, then we can use the dike standard. If it's above six feet, we have to go to another standard. OK. So I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, the, the other two uh, typical cross sections that are in the spreadsheet that kind of explain how things are is the pipe drop structure, which you usually see more on pond type type designs for principal spillways. Um, occasionally they can go into a wetland with a berm, but we don't really see that too often. Uh, and then probably the one we see the, the least would be the hooded inlet type, uh, which is just a straight pipe with a hooded inlet. Um, there is a design to, to that, but most of the times we're not really going to size that to handle a storm. It's usually used for um, just bringing the permanent pool down to a certain elevation, not necessarily for carrying in any sort of storm, but very rarely we can get this one in as well. Okay, the next design tool that I'd like to talk about is more of a uh, a description of a way to do things uh, for maximum diversity within the wetland itself. There is a uh, biological biology technical note uh, out of Indiana NRCS that we reference a bunch up up here in area one uh, that has some pretty good information about the different types of sort of elevation and pool depths to uh, maximize your biodiversity within the wetland pool itself. It's nine pages. And if you're welcome or if you want to uh, find it, you can search Indiana's NRCS site or you can just email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. But basically the takeaway I get from it is you want to uh, div uh, diversify the topographic features as much as possible. Shallow areas, deep areas, mounds, ridges, islands and all the things in between. Generally, the shallower the depth is where you get the most biological productivity. You get a lot of vegetation. You get a lot of macro invertebrates in there. Uh, you get a lot of root shoot turnover rates. You remember I talked about the phosphorus uh, 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 phosphorus specifications to maximize that reduction. Those are the areas where that occurs and it's usually the deeper waters that generally don't have as much biological productivity. Now there are useful, uh, but generally it's the shallow areas that are better. Um, it generally suggests to if, if you can do this, if, if you are building a dike to try to use your borrow material from inside the pool and don't take it from one big giant blob where you're making it, you know, eight foot deep, you know, sort of scatter it out across the inside of the pool uh, inside of the dike uh, so that you have a pretty good maximum diversity. Um, and then probably the big thing, the big takeaway I get is here is it gives us sort of sort of a percentage breakdown of depths of what you want to shoot for for any wetland and don't take this as a concrete way to do things like if it doesn't meet these exact percentages and depths it's not going to work it, that's not the case um, generally what it says is about uh, half of the permanent pool area should be pretty shallow uh, six inches or less and then the other half should be somewhere between the immediate depths and the deeper depths uh, but certainly no deeper than six feet we're not building ponds out here. If there's fish to uh, survive in wetlands, we probably didn't do a good job designing the wetland depths. OK, uh, that's not the purpose of these. We have built some of the cases where they've built them 12 foot deep because they made claims that they had to get the borrowed material from somewhere, but honestly they wanted a pond. And so we want to try to uh, limit those specific cases as much as possible. OK. Moving on to one of the civil 3D methods that I want to talk about here today is using corridors for building a dike. 
If you've been doing any kind of grass waterway design through Civil 3D, you've probably seen my my uh, YouTube webinars on on how to use a corridor for the design of a grass waterway. And I walk you through the entire process, how to build a surface, use the corridor, build the surface of the waterway, and then put together the plans and everything in between. The same process that we have on those uh, uh, those old YouTube videos is the same process when you do a dike. The only difference really is that if you remember when we built the assemblies, and I'll go through this here in a second, um, instead of building the typical uh, either the typical parabolic or the typical trapezoidal grass waterway, you're just going to flip it upside down and you're going to create a top bank and some side banks, um, just like an upside down waterway. And it's just as simple. From then on, you just follow the same methods that, that we use in those YouTube videos. So I'll talk about here the design grade when I mean 0.0% on the profile view, but it basically it, if you think of it in terms of a grass water wave, you know, typically they have some sort of percent grade, whether it's 1%, 2% or whatever. In this case, we're going to have a flat, flat grade for the dike. But I'll go through that. And then the other method I'll talk about here in a second is using gradings to create shallow excavations. Um, I've listed out four general steps. If you remember when I go through the corridor videos, uh, I sort of lay it out, you know, step by step, all all individually, every little thing you need to do. Um, this is not that. This is just more general things. You know, the four steps you need to do to use gratings. There are some smaller steps in between that I'll kind of show on this uh, this particular webinar. Um, but there are many more things about the grading methods that, well, for number one, I'm not that aware of. Uh, but also things that can go wrong, little things you have to make sure you get right. Um, so just know that there are other steps in between these to, to get a full full uh, grading for your site. All right, I'm going to switch over here and do a, a live demo in AutoCAD and also pull up the uh, uh, spreadsheet first. If you want copies of the spreadsheet, you're going to have to send me an email. Uh, the reason it is not posted anywhere on our site are on the, on the NRCS engineering site is because it's not officially uh, sponsored or or uh, designed by NRCS. It's something we use that works, but just understand that if you use it, you're still responsible for the, uh, the entire design. OK, so I'll send it to you, no problem, but um, just just keep in mind it's not an official NRCS spreadsheet. Uh, and you may have to do something different than what the spreadsheet does say, depending on what your area engineer uh, is, is deciding that they want. OK, so let me get out of presentation mode and see if I can figure out where the spreadsheet is. There it is. OK, let me blow this up a bit so that we can see it. This is the same example that I had earlier in the presentation. It should have the same information in it, I think. Um, the one thing I wanted to show you in this particularly is that there are some limitations to what this can be used for. So within the Dyke standard, it basically says that if you have a watershed to pool ratio of greater than 10 to 1, you have to use the pond standard, not, not the Dyke standard. So in this case, my permanent pool is 3.6 acres. If, for instance, my watershed was 37 acres, it's going to spit out something at the bottom that says use the pond standard. Don't use this. OK, so keep that in mind that uh, sometimes you'll get those sort of pop ups that say either change, you know, an elevation or use a different uh, uh, standard, which we don't have a spreadsheet for. OK. Another one of them down here that I talked about was selecting the specific emergency type. So here I have selected the armored type. And if you notice, my permanent pool elevation and my emergency uh, elevation is the same at 802.3. So essentially the permanent pool, once it fills up even a little bit, it's going to start discharging through the emergency spillway. And I'm doing this because I'm not counting on any storm routing. OK. But if I were to change this and select the vegetated option, Again, it's going to come up and spit out saying, hey, you selected the vegetated option, so you've either got to increase your stage, which is the difference in elevation between the emergency and the permanent, or uh, go back to the armored type. Okay, 
So if I wanted this to work, I would have to decrease the elevation of the permanent pool for this site to 801.3. And, and there it works. OK. Now the one thing. That in this case, it does ask for a uh, design of the principal spillway. But the one thing I mentioned earlier is that you most of the time not do not use this because you'll either be selecting some sort of rock protection for the emergency or like in this case, it says you still don't need to do anything for the principal. And the reason it says this is that it's basically saying when the uh, storm starts starts to flow, you get some amount of storage uh, through the emergency spillway and you can route that. This is saying here that I can store. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, some amount of storage between the permanent pool elevation and the emergency spillway elevation. So in this case, the stage was one foot. So as that water starts to fill up from the permanent pool and before it gets to the emergency spillway, there's some amount of storage in there, which in this case, based on the pool areas and the watershed coming to it, is that I can store 1.75 watershed inches within that pool. While for a a two year storm, I only have 1.12 watershed inches, so I can store the entire two year storm. In the elevation difference between the permanent and the emergency pools, OK? So because I can store the entire storm, it's going to say, hey, you don't really need anything. Uh, uh, really other than some sort of control structure of any size uh, to bring down your permanent pool elevation. So uh, keep that in mind. Most of your designs will fall into this category because they put the 10 to 1 watershed to pool ratio on the dike standard for for wetlands. Uh, most of them nowadays will not have a principal spillway sized of any size. There's a rare case of exception where you're below. I think it's uh, if you're below 10 acres watershed and your permanent pool is a certain size based to your watershed. You might have the very slightest size of principal spillway that needs to be designed and that's only if you select the vegetated type type for the spillway. If you pick the armored, it doesn't matter whatever your scenario is. OK. So just keep that in mind there. Um, th there's not really much else I want to want to show you other than the emergency spillway design summary down here that spits out that's pulled from this section right here. Uh, that is generally what you're going to use for the size of your spillway. So in this case, we want to pass 23 CFS. Um, it's 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 saying that what we need is a 24 foot bottom width fully fully level uh, spillway size. OK, so just think of uh, if you go along the dike, then you need 24 feet of bottom width of a trapezoidal spillway. OK. Um, not much else I want to show you here other than there are some other aspects to the spreadsheet. There is a tab here where if you were surveying the old way and you wanted to get an estimate on the amount of volume um, that the dike is going to take based on your design, you can still use this. But again, the methods I'm going to show you, you don't need to use this anymore. Uh, the cross sections, like I said, they're all here. These are just you know, for example only basically. And then as you go on, these are the chapter 11 charts. That is the routing method I talked about to where the program uh, figures out what your storage volume is, what your runoff volume is, and based on what those are, you can kind of go across here if you have, you know, 0.7 uh, watershed inches of storage and and you have, let's say 1.8 uh, watershed inches of runoff, then you can reduce the storm by a factor of uh, 0.25. OK, that's how the, the whole chapter 11 method works. You don't really need to know about this much too much because it pulls from this spreadsheet, but just just understand that it is there. Uh, and then this is just more background data in this tab here. So. The only one you really need to know is the first tab for the for the spreadsheet of, of design, OK? All right, let's get out of this and let's go into some AutoCAD. All right, this first example is a corridor example for a dike. This is a U-shaped dike, which 
I'll, I'll explain why, um, but it's pretty common something that we do up here. If you think of the natural landscape, there's basically, I'll say, three scenarios to install a dike. You either have a swale to where you can build a straight one-sided dike that you just basically build across the swale and you back up water, okay? There are types like this where you have a uniform down gradient uh, slope of a field. So in this case, everything here is sloping towards uh, the north here, but it's a uniform grade. It's not a swale of any kind. In that case, you'll build a three-sided dike so that you can kind of um, sort of uh, sort of catch all the runoff that would uh, start from the south and run into the dike. And then you got the ones that we do up by the lake that are the four sided dikes where they don't receive any natural runoff, but they are pumped into from the streams that are somewhere nearby. OK, and that's a whole different uh, subject, uh, but basically those are the, the scenarios that you've got. In any one of those, you'll still use the same process for building the dike. Um, just like with the waterways, you draw an alignment, you create a profile, uh, you attach it to the surface, and you figure out whatever the parameters are for your dike for top width and side slopes and things like that. Uh, and then you use that information over here. If you can kind of follow along with me, this is the assembly I used for the dike. You can see that it's much the same as the waterway. We have this this subassembly part here, which is a linked width and slope. It's just zero slope, so it's flat. And then this one here on the side is a daylight uh, max width, which is the same thing we use for a grass waterway. So really only two subassemblies on a side, um, and that's all it takes to build the dike. You're going to use that, go through the corridor method all the way around, and you should have something that looks sim uh, similar to this. OK, depending on your slope of the ground. When you get to the point when you're ready to build a profile, this is generally what the profile of the dike's going to look. Now, if you kind of imagine this, this looks like a swale cross section, right? It, it sort of looks like you've got a low point in the middle. This could be a flow line and you got the highest points on, on the on the two sides, but which if you were just looking at this, you wouldn't necessarily know this was the shape of a U right in the field. Um, that's the biggest thing when you build uh, any type of dike is you've got to make sure that you've got some elevation from the start of the dike to the end of the dike that you can tie into uh, and basically close off the pool to force the pool to go through the principal spillway or if it fills up too much to go through the, uh, the emergency spillway, which I didn't talk about before, but in this specific case, I did to design the shape of the emergency spillway into the corridor. You certainly don't have to do that. You could certainly have just, just done the corridor as a straight uh, upside down trapezoidal shape and all the way across and then just sort of hand drawn the, the spillway in there. That's perfectly fine. Uh, the overall yardage that you would move difference would not be that much, so I wouldn't, wouldn't be worried about it. But if you are skilled enough at the Civil 3D, you could do this like I did it. OK, but in, in general, that's what you have. You have some sort of swale cross section and then you have up here the top of the dike that would be finished. All right. So I'm not going to spend much more time about talking about the corridors, uh, but I will go over to the grading. And this is I, I'm guessing some of you want to see this if you've not used the uh, grading tools themselves because they're kind of cool. And at the same time, they can also be a pain in the butt. Uh, seems like I always get some errors that occur and I'm not sure why and I got to start over. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you do have the same issues I, I do and some things don't exactly work right, you can do it again and sometimes it'll work. I, I'm not the expert. I just know enough to get it done and that's what I hope, hope to show you here today. The first step with creating the uh, shallow excavation grading is you have to draw a feature line. In this case, I'll start with a polyline and I'll draw whatever shape to represent the top edge of the excavation limit. Okay, so I have a general shape. That's that's what I want the excavation to be. Let's say that's um, that's what I had sort of decided up front. I can convert that into a, a feature line or I could have just 
just drawing the feature line outright. That's perfectly fine too. There's there is a dialog box that will pop up that asks you the grading site um, and the style and a couple other things. If you're only doing one grading, you don't really need to worry about this, but I will say if you're going to do multiple gradings for multiple shallow excavations at once, uh, then you want to make sure you name your sites. You know, you, um, let's say you have wetland cell number one, wetland cell number two, it doesn't really matter, um, but you do want to keep them on separate sites because that will help you later on when you build the surface. But for now, we're going to leave it as is. And the one thing you want to make sure you get right is you want to assign elevations to the feature line. OK, make sure that's a check mark. This next box po pops up here, which is the assign elevations. Um, basically what it's asking is what elevation do you want this this uh, a line, this top edge of the excavation to be at? Well, I would like it to be the same elevation as my existing surface that I have already built here. Whatever the elevation is, wherever it is, that's what I would like it to be. And that's what I have already selected. OK, so there's my feature line. The next step after you have the feature line is to create some gradings. So up here there is a grading tool. You want the grading creation tools. And then you have a bunch of different options up here. Now this is where, like I said earlier, if you're doing multiple gradings for multiple sites, you probably want to use this left button here, which you can change the uh, grading groups. Um, but if you're only doing one, then you don't really need to worry about it. Um, like I said, so for now we won't. Um, basically what the step is, is how do you want to cut the hole? What sort of shape do you want the hole to be in, inside of this? OK, um, in most AutoCAD defaults, and again, a lot of you have different tools because either you're on the NRCS software, uh, you have their templates uploaded or you're on your own. You use uh, my templates over the year. You use someone else's templates. Generally, you're probably going to have different options to create the gradients like I have here. Um, hopefully, some of the options you have is one is grade to distance, one is grade to elevation, and one is grade to relative elevation. And I'm going to show you these two here, the, uh, the grade to relative elevation and uh, the, the grade to elevation. Let's start with the grade to elevation. OK. Now I just need to create a grading. So there's a button right here where it says create the grading. I'm going to do that. And again, I can name this for the grading group. I'll just call this West. Whoops. West site for now. Um, I have an option here where it'll automatically create a surface as you go through the grading. You can do that. Certainly you can make this uh, and select the surface type you'd like, or you can not do this, and then at the end you can create a surface from the grading. It doesn't really matter one way or another, uh, but I'll go ahead and make sure that's checked, and one in five pink is fine for me. Hit OK. Hit OK. Now it's asking at the bottom to select a feature, so I drew the feature line. It's, actually, it's asking me to select the feature line, so I'll select it. It's asking select the grading side. I want to grade to the inside of this because again that feature line represents my top outer edge, so I want to grade everything inside of this. So just select somewhere in the middle. And it's got a question that says apply to the entire length. So yes. Uh, it's asking me because I selected grade to elevation, what elevation do I want the bottom of this cell to be? So if you can see here are some of my contours. This one down here is 798 let's say uh, and let's say you know I would like a three foot deep pool so three feet uh, less than 798 is 795 so we can type in 795 and hit enter what slope would you like to cut hit enter 10 to 1 slope what would you like to fill there shouldn't be any fill because I selected an elevation that was less than what the feature line is everywhere. Again, 10 to 1 fill just in case. And you get a surface created here. That that generally represents the way if we were to cut a hole down here where this entire flat bottom was at 795 at elevation. 
this is what it would take to start at the feature line out in the field and cut down slope at a 10 to 1. Uh, this is sort of what it would look like to get down down to that elevation. Obviously, up, up slope, you're going to have to cut um, much deeper to get down there, and then at the down slope, you only have to cut maybe three feet down. OK, but this is is not the last step. There is always one step that I tend to forget uh, where you need to create a grading infill. OK, so up here where I created a grading, there's a little drop down where there's one selection that call, says create infill. You want to select that and you want to select inside the bottom of the grading. OK, you can see this little red um, diamond popped up, which is a good thing. It, it tells me it worked. OK. And you can hit escape. That's it. That's a grading. Uh, we've built a surface from the grading. We've cut it in. It's automatically chosen the shape to get down to it from a 10 to 1 slope from the yellow line. I could have moved this yellow line any way I wanted to. It didn't have to be this certain uh, of a shape. Um, I do have something a little funky going on right here. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It probably has something to do with my feature line from the beginning. Um, but it is a little odd, but that's the basic pro process to create a grading. The other way I could have created a, was instead of grade to elevation, I could have done a grade to relative elevation. OK, so when I did the grade to rel I'm sorry, I, I did the grade to elevation and what that is is a grade to an absolute elevation. OK, so I chose 795. So everywhere along the, the uh, feature line, it's going to grade downward until it gets to that elevation. If I were to choose the, the grade to relative elevation, that is a relative elevation compared to where the feature line is. So in this case, if I would have chosen relative elevation, let's say this red line here is at an elevation 805. OK, so right here on the feature line, that elevation is going to be 805. If I chose a relative elevation of negative three feet, and it's important to put the negative because if you put the positive, it's going to fill. OK then basically what this would do is it would cut at a 10 to 1 slope because I would have picked the uh, same slope cut until it got to three feet below where this point is and it would do that all the way around the feature line. OK, so what does that look like? Well, to save time, I went ahead and did it um, and I showed you the basically the two examples. The example to the left is using the relative elevation and the example to the right or the east is uh, using the absolute elevation. OK, and you can see the surfaces look slightly different. OK, well, let's look at the profiles to see what's going on over here. So the one to the left or on the west side here, you can see the green line is the existing ground line. That's my surveyed surface. And the yellow line is the grading bottom surface that I drew these uh, these alignments through here that way. OK. This is the relative elevation. It basically said everywhere where the feature line is, I want to cut down three feet. OK, no, no absolute elevation. It's just whatever this elevation is right here, we're cutting down three feet and that's the bottom of this this uh, shallow uh, shallow excavation, let's say. OK, and it started everywhere. It went down to 10 to 1 slope down to get to three feet below wherever the feature line is at that point. OK. Whereas the one I uh, did the example for, this was the absolute elevation. OK, so it didn't matter what the existing ground did up here on the green. I told it that I wanted the bottom of the pool to be 795 in that case. In this case, I chose 796, it looks like. Um, but I, it didn't matter where the existing ground was. I wanted to get down to 796. OK, so it's going to cut at a 10 to 1 to get down there. Well, you can see once you go uphill, you've got a lot of cutting to get down to 10 to 1. OK. So what's the advantage and the disadvantage of the two two methods? Um, I drew a blue line cutting through both of them to represent where the pool would be, the maximum pool. OK. Uh, Basically, it would be if this is the low end, then water is going to fill up in the pool until it got to that elevation, then it would run outside. Makes sense, OK? 
Um, in the relative elevation method, you can see that it's kind of nice that you're going to get these nice and gradual sort of shallower depths the further you go uphill and have some nice biological productivity. That's all good, but you can see there's a lot of wasted space here. <laughs> it was probably useless to do any sort of cutting up there. OK, so that's kind of wasted space. All right, so that gives me some sort of clue that maybe I should have made my cut much shorter in length than stopped it possibly right here at say 300 to one, which to give you an example of where that would be is right 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 there is station 300. So basically maybe I should have made this shape down to station 300 and stopped right there for that particular uh, cell and did a second one further upstream that is not connected to this one. That way you can have multiple stair steps. OK, so that's a good pretty good wetland. If I just focus on, you know, the first 300 feet, um, not too bad. Uh, and then you get down to where you did the absolute elevation. You can see that when I dig this hole, I'm going to have three feet of pool pretty much everywhere. The entire bottom uh, length and width of this is going to have three foot of pool. Nice, even grade all the way across. Uh, obviously, that's not good uh, diversity in the in the, uh, the entire built uh, landscape, I guess, out there. Uh, it's the same single depth, which is not you know, desirable, let's say, but it does increase the pool area quite a lot, quite a bit if I do that. OK, and yes, you could have maybe sloped up this bottom width up here to where you have the diversity. But the point I'm trying to make here is you still have a lot of distance here, say three feet or so between the existing ground to get down to pool. So you're still cutting a lot of dirt, a lot of dirt to get down to the pool level. And that's just wasted dirt. So this is another sort of sort of clue that says, hey, maybe we should have made this pool shorter and went uh, less of a distance uphill so that maybe we cut it off right here at station 200 to where we're not excavating so much dirt above where the pool would be. OK, now obviously your pool is in much uh, smaller, but what that allows you to do is then stair step with other individual pools as you go uphill. So in general, that's what you want to kind of think about. There's no right or wrong method. Either one of these is fine. Uh, you can pick the absolute elevation and you can stair step it. You can do the relative elevation because you want the diversity. Uh, just keep in mind that the contractors still have to build it to whatever you plan it. So maybe the uh, doing the absolute elevation is easier for construction purposes. It's easier to check out there, um, but neither one is right and neither one is wrong, but there is a better way to do both of them, if that makes sense. Shorten up the shallow excavation and do multiple them as you go uphill, assuming of course you have the good soils. OK, that's that's basically. I mean, that's. That's the grading method. That's that's the way it goes. Um, you can then use these surfaces that uh, have been created from the grading. You can paste them into the general ground surface if you want. You can do a surface comparison to get the yardage moved and uh, all that stuff, which is shown in the YouTube webinars for the corridors. The, the same process is the same for that as it is for this. Um, not too difficult, but just keep in mind that there are a few things that can go wrong that you might have to have to start over. And like I had in the first one, you'll have these weird surfaces that have these weird. Uh, where was it? This this stuff right here, which we know is not right. We know something's going on. We just can't really figure it out. Maybe it's as simple as moving the feature line over a little bit. It, it's hard to say. Stuff like that can get a little. Uh, I'll say annoying when you go through the gradings, but it, if you're able to handle it and get through it, they work pretty slick. OK, Gr so I'm not going to go through this, but when I first started gr doing gradings, did this turn? Uh, this this was the one I wanted right here. I actually started building the dikes using the grading method before I realized, well, duh, just use an upside down waterway and you got a dike. So before I realized that, I was using the grading method to do dikes. And you can see here, I gen this is a site where I've built a dike using the grading method. Um, I didn't put the surface up because it gets sort of uh, sort of busy 
in here. But basically, I started with a, a feature line that uh, represents the center line of the dike, and I graded uh, at a flat slope out to half the, the top of the dike width on both sides, and that gets the full width of the top of the dike. And then from there, I graded down slope uh, to get to the existing uh, ground on both sides, and that created a nice looking dike. And we actually built this one out in the field in, um, in Hancock County this way. So you can do it that way. I don't recommend it because we're pretty familiar with the corridor process um, and there's less that goes wrong uh, through that process than through the grading. I think this particular one I had to redo three times because I was having trouble with the grading getting it right, but you can do it. I just don't really recommend it. OK, you can kind of see here. It's a similar setup to what the corridor one showed. You have some general swell with the green line of existing ground, even though it's a U shaped dike. You have to have a starting elevation where you can tie the dike in and an ending elevation and still using the gradient. You can see here it's just a flat grade at top all the way across. OK. So. It's possible. But I would stick with the corridors. The last thing I wanted to show, um, and I think we still have some time left here, um, is I wanted to show you the way I go about first sizing a uh, wetland pool for a dike. And let me get rid of the grading here because I don't need it anymore. Whoops. OK. There we go. Let's use this as an example of a site where I've done the survey. I know I want a diked wetland because it's got the hydro. Um, it's got the hydric soils. It's got a watershed coming to it. I know I want to control it. Um, so how do I go about planning the depth of the dike or the total dike dike height, the pool area and everything about it? The way I start with it is I, I always start with four feet. Uh, for the permanent pool, four feet is what I'm talking about. So I'll pick the lowest elevation where the dike will go across, in this case, 797. And I'll say the permanent pool should not be any greater than four feet above that elevation. OK. And I'll explain why in a second, but let's just start with that for now. So four feet more than 797 is 801. OK. So in general, I want to follow where I would build the dike depending on site uh, lib uh, limitations. And I want to go up to the 801 contour, which is this one right here. And from there, I'll trace that contour to about where I think the dike would stop on the third branch. OK, and then I can draw kind of following where I think the dike will go. And generally, this is what I do. Uh, to get a permanent pool plan. This is sort of the starting point for doing any kind of engineering plan, but also for what, what we've been doing for the water quality incentive program is it gives me a good approximation of where I think the permanent pool will be. Um, the reason I chose four feet is because if we're going to use the dike standard, the dike has to be less than six feet tall. OK, so if the total dike is six foot tall and we have one foot of freeboard uh, between the top of the dike um, and the emergency spillway and then you have let's say one foot to a half a foot of stage between the principal and the auxiliary spillway that's about two feet okay so i know that in general i don't want to build any more than a six foot tall dike okay and if i have a six foot tall dike generally permanent pool is going to be about four feet okay because it's going to be two feet below the dike um When you do then for the spreadsheet, it asks it asks you to find pools for uh, the emergency spillway and for the flow depth going through. You do the same process. Let's say the uh, emergency spillway is a foot above the permanent pool. You do the same thing. You kind of trace out from where the dike would start and find 802 because the emergency spill spillway would be approximately one foot greater then the permanent pool and you kind of trace the same area. From there. And the difference between the two. Is what you would enter inside the spreadsheet for those pool areas. OK. 
that's how I go about it. That's a good starting point. You can always adjust this later on as you go through the different uh, sizes and shapes and, and location of the dike, but that's that's about how it's done. I'm trying to think, Tim, if there's anything else that I missed or is that there's any questions or anything in the chat box that has come through. We did have a couple questions come in through the chat. Uh, first one was, if we have a non-hydric soil with hydric inclusion, inclusions, are they eligible for enrollment if we have a soil scientist verify it? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that, yes, that's absolutely uh, true and allowed. Um, most of you are familiar with the soil types in your areas. Um, in my case, the Puamo Blount uh, soil types, generally the Blounts have a lot of inclusions with the, the, uh, the Puamo soil type. And as long as you know the type of the type of topo topography to look for, uh, you can probably know which ones to get the soil scientist out on. Um, but yes, if if they do find the um, hydric soils in the non-hydric mapped soils, uh, they will generally put together a shape file that you can use to import into your AutoCAD program to figure out where exactly the hydric soils lie. Um, so yes, we can certainly do that and we do that all the time. We had another question. If the goal is to, of our wetland is to reduce phosphorus and capture sediment, mm -hmm. should we plant it a little deeper to account for some sediment storage? No. Um, you can build a sediment basin and you can catch it that way. Um, the question comes back as to how much sediment is going to get to it. OK, if there's a buffer that's three times the size of the pool, uh, there's probably a lot of sediment that's going to wash out in the buffer. Um, we should not be building these diked wetlands in particular. We should not be building them as sediment traps. If there is an area that has a severe, severe erosion issue, there's a lot of sediment coming to it. Generally, probably your engineer is going to question you on if if we should be building a, a diked wetland at all. OK, these aren't sediment traps. Um, they do trap sediment. I'm not to say that's not what they do, but that's not their main purpose. OK, there are better uh, practices that, that do that. There are our design. If you think of the Wascop design, they only have a 10 year lifespan because guess what? They fill up with sediment. So no, that is not uh, an approval for you to go ahead and dig these things with a 10 foot deep bottom to store sediment because uh, in five years you'll come and you'll see fish and derbies out there with all these fish they've put in. So. Good try, but no. We had another question in the chat. Is there a recommended distance to set back any wetland construction from a property line? Can that distance be part of a wetland buffer? Yes, yes and yes. Um, so it is in the standard. So look up the 356 dike standard and I'll actually pull it up here uh, as I talk through it. But what I want you to do is go through it all because there are little things like that that talks about and it would take me a while to find that specific one, but there is one on talking about keeping the dikes away from property lines and not just property lines, but also it's got some language in here that talks about the dike shouldn't be any any taller than the neighboring upstream property line, which uh, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to get at with that, but there are things like that that should be used. So yes, there is a setback limit and off the top of my head, I'm trying to think what it is. I, I want to say it's 30 feet. Dike shall be located in such that the outside downstream toe is a minimum of 30 feet from property line or easement boundary. So there you go. But all kinds of things like this are in the dike standard. So look through it um, and get familiar with it. And that should be helpful. Is there anything else, Tim? Oh, we had a comment just about Ohio drainage law. We cannot back up water across property yeah. lines. Very true. Yes. Always want Very to be true. looking out for that. Yes, um, I didn't mention that, but uh, let's go back to this one here. Let's say, for instance, in this site that there was a property line that shot through. Let's just pick one like this. I would definitely push it. Well, for one, definitely the permanent pool cannot be outside this property line. Even then, I'd still want a buffer between the permanent pool and the property line. But also any flow storm, I'd want to try to push uh, to the inside of this property line. 
OK, so that is a good point is you got to check your elevations. You got to see where the permanent pool is, where the emergency pool is and where the depth of the flow is through the emergency pool would go to make sure that we're not pushing any uh, water back uphill. Uh, for an unreasonable amount. There is language in the law that does allow for things such as wetlands to be constructed as long as it does unreasonably uh, back up water. But in general, we're just going to avoid that altogether. The only other thing that I just now remember and I wanted to cover was on your engineering plans for a, a diked wetland or for a shallow excavation. There's not a lot to them. You got your standard uh, standard cover sheet. You've got a plan layout that shows where the dike goes. You got some construction notes. You got some layout points. And then really it's just a profile with a typical cross section. Because your uh, your cross sections are going to vary all the way across, you really only need to have a typical cross section. And I always like to do one where the structure is. But there's not a lot to it. it the, the big thing when you put together a set of engineering plans for a dike or shallow excavation is make sure you put the elevation in uh, um, location, whether it be GPS location or station location of where specific items go. So like in this case, you can see on the profile, I, I spell out what elevation that should be at at the bottom. If you don't, they'll get it wrong. I spell out where the top of the dike should be. If you don't, they'll get it wrong. Just make sure you're very clear on your details here and it, even on your typical uh, uh, your typical details, make sure you show the core trends, make sure you show, you know, if you got a principal spillway here you're using for control structure make sure you show the rack that's going to go on there to stop stop debris if you want it uh, if you don't show the stuff they're not going to do it because these things are so pretty bare bones and simple okay that's all i had tim um there's nothing else i'm done we don't have any more questions in the chat if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question feel free uh, Justin, I might recommend that you show folks the object viewer for a surface or a corridor that you've created just as a tool they can use to help visualize what they've created in Civil 3D. I can try, Tim. Um, the issue that I've got is with this newer template that I'm using, it doesn't show things like I used to, but I will give it a shot. Yeah, if I can find the object object viewer, there it is. Just right click and OK. I got it. Most of these don't really do a good job on mine of showing what I want. Let's do. Maybe that kind of helps. No, not really. You can't really can't really see it that well. So anyhow, I, yeah, it, it, this can be useful. You can kind of see right there. You kind of see the bottom edge of the um, uh, shallow excavation downslope right there. You can kind of see it, but I generally don't find this too helpful for me. But if you do, that's more power to you. So sometimes I'll utilize it if I've created something and the grading's coming out funky like you were showing earlier it'll help me pinpoint what's going on mm -hmm. or if I missed doing that infill like you mentioned it'll show up there but okay. okay we don't have any more questions in the chat at this time last chance if anybody's got anything I think that's it Justin all right, well, thanks, everybody.